Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Off the Crutch. I'm Travis Davis. It's been a little while because, again, I got sick and didn't have the ability to record. Thankfully, I'm all better now, and to say I'm excited about today's episode is an understatement. We're right in the middle of Mental Health Awareness Month and thought it would be appropriate to have a mental health expert on. Her name is Melody Wilding. To give some background, a couple years ago, I was at Barnes & Noble and came across this book titled Trust Yourself. I was flipping through the pages and wouldn't you know, my name was in the book. For context, this Travis was a client of hers trying to get unstuck with his business. One particular part really resonated with me. Through our coaching conversations, Travis realized he was overcomplicating things. He didn't need more input or knowledge. He already had everything he needed to start his business and simply needed to decide on the very best next step rather than trying to model pricing and revenue in the distant future. After I read that, I thought, this is exactly me. So I bought the book and reached out to Melody for an interview. This is jam-packed with a lot of wisdom. Before we get into the conversation, though, let me just highlight some of her accomplishments. Melody Wilding is the best-selling author of Trust Yourself, Stop Overthinking and Channel Your Emotions for Success at Work, and an executive and leadership coach for smart, sensitive, high achievers who are tired of getting in their own way. Through her coaching programs, talks, small group workshops, and articles, she can help you break free from self-doubt and overwhelm master your emotions, and use your sensitivity as the superpower that it is. Recently named one of Business Insider's most innovative coaches, Melody coined the groundbreaking idea of sensitive striving. She has helped CEOs, leaders, and top performers at the world's most successful companies, including Google, Facebook, J.P. Morgan, Verizon, and more. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Oprah Magazine, NBC News, and dozens of other high-profile publications. Melody is a sensitive striver herself, a licensed social worker with a master's degree from Columbia University and a former researcher at Rutgers University here at Hunter College, and is a contributor to Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Business Insider. In addition, she has over seven LinkedIn learning courses from Overcome Overthinking to Making Hard Career Choices. Now with that, here's the interview. I don't know how long ago it was, but I was in Barnes and Noble and I was just walking around. So I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I don't know if I had mentioned that in the my LinkedIn message, but I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I was walking around my local Barnes and Noble and I saw Trust Yourself. And I'm sure like many of your clients, I struggle with trusting myself. So that title, I gravitated towards it. And then I started flipping through the book and then I saw it was on page page 55, Strategy in Action, Travis. So I saw my name and I was oh. like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I didn't and, even make that connection, honestly. And everything that yeah. in this chapter about giving yourself permission mm-hmm. was everything that I was struggling with because at that time I was in the process of starting or wanting to start a consulting business. And Mm. I was feeling like I just need to get everything right. I need to have Mm -hmm. everything lined up. I need to read all the books. I need to follow all these steps. And Mm -hmm. I can't do it until I'm ready to start. And then in the book, you said, don't wait until you're ready. Just go and do it. (laughs) And so I was like, man, this is really cool. And then I found you on LinkedIn and I never, ever thought that this could happen up until about several, a few months ago, I went through some different career, career change and Mm -hmm. decided to restart my podcast. I had been doing it since 2020 and I've been working with my therapist about Mm. things that bring me joy and trying to figure out what that looks like. And then I just remembered the initial messages that we sent on LinkedIn. And I'm like, probably a long shot, but let's see (laughs) if she would agree to come on my podcast. 
And you did. And yeah, I'm really thankful. Oh, I'm, I love stories like that. And it's always, that brings me so much joy to hear you just stumbled across it in a bookstore. That's the best versus, oh, I came across it on LinkedIn. I don't know. It's just different when it's in person and it calls to you. And that is, that's fantastic to know. And I'm so glad. It's been a really fun book to read. Very informative with a lot of actionable steps. So that it's really great. Yes. Maybe too many actionable steps. That is some feedback I, I've received that it there's a lot in there. And especially like the exercises, you do have to pause to do them and then remember to come back to the book. It's yes, I tried to make it as comprehensive as possible, maybe a little too comprehensive in some ways, but yeah. Oh, do good. you feel like it may be easier to do this book alongside a therapist because there's so much in it? I think it is. I think it depends on your style. Personally, I know I'm, even though I'm pretty introverted, I'm a verbal processor. Mm -hmm. And so I can write something down and reflect on something, but it doesn't click for me. And I'm better at translating it into action when I can talk through it and synthesize it with someone. Mm -hmm. And yes, I think for a lot of people, I've had many therapists say, I give this book to my clients and we, or even coaches and we work on it together. Of course, I have people join my programs and they're going through the book at the same time. So I think if, especially if you think you're someone who that the reflection and the processing of it, and there's also accountability again, because it's one thing to do the exercises, but then it's another thing to actually implement what you're getting out of them. Mm -hmm. And of course, having someone else to do it with makes a huge difference in that respect. Can you share a little bit about how you got into psychology and your background? Yeah. If we go way, way back, which many careers do, I think, have seeds of when you're very young. So from a very young age, I was a people watcher and I was very curious about how people tick. And I also grew up in an environment where being very perceptive and attuned to the moods and needs of people around me was beneficial. It was what I needed to do. And I also, in my younger life, I played the role of peacekeeper at home, which I find many people I work with can relate to. And so that really set me on this path of wanting to understand human relationships and psychology And I did take the traditional path of that is what my degree is in. I worked in research labs and really wanted something that was closer to people instead of in the ivory tower. Did my degree in social work and then got plopped into the real world where I felt like I had ticked all the boxes. I had I had done step A, step B, step C, and then I was left not only feeling left without a map, except how do I continue to achieve, but also all of those habits that I had accumulated growing up and just the nature of of who I am as a more sensitive person, which I'm sure we'll talk about. They started to catch catch up with me big time, especially in my career, since our work takes up 70% of or more of our life. I was really people pleasing, deferring to what everybody else wanted, working around the clock. I had no boundaries. I was responding to every single message and request, working in a toxic work environment where I did not know how to deal with the people around me and was really letting their negativity and emotions affect me and my self-esteem. And so I really found myself at a breaking point where I felt lost professionally, but also internally where I had no trust with myself. I hit a very severe burnout. And that that was really my wake up moment to say, I, I have all of these skills. I have this training and this background. Why aren't I using this on myself? And so that, that sent me on my own journey. And then also at the time I began on the side, opening up my own coaching and therapy practice, which grew to be my full-time work over the years. And now Flash forward, here we are over a decade later. And yes, this is what I do day in and day out. And I love it, I think, because it also it comes from a place of trying to transform my pain and my struggles into something that can help other people. So 
other people don't have to go through the same thing. I think that's a really great story. Did you wrestle with self-doubt when you decided to start your coaching and therapy business on the side? Yes, I still wrestle (laughs) with self-doubt. You teach what you most need to learn. And sometimes it is new level, same devil, the same Mm, challenges come up in different formats. And yes, I thought, who am I to do this? What are all my colleagues going to think? Because certainly at the time over a decade ago, coaching was really looked down on. It was not like it is today. It was considered weird and something remedial that people only did if they were underperforming or failing. And I luckily did grow up in a family of entrepreneurs. So I'm very grateful for that. My my close family was extremely supportive, even though they said, you sure you're going to be able to pay the bills with this? But of course, I, I was taking a, a path that was very different from all of my friends and many of my other colleagues. And I felt I felt that judgment and I internalized that as maybe this is the wrong choice. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. And all of the what are people going to think with me? Can I actually make my clients happy? All of that was very mixed up in there. And at what point did you decide you wanted to write a book? I had known from a very young age I wanted to be a writer. I was that kid who would build pillow forts and write little books in there. But I never dreamed. I thought it was a a pie in the sky. This is when I'm in my retirement and I'm leaving my legacy work. I thought it was very far off. But actually what happened is I spoke in an event. And afterwards, a woman came up to me and handed me her business card and said, I'm from this publisher, would love for you to write a book for us. And I thought, wait, is she talking to me? Or did she mean to talk to someone else? And that was a moment of somebody else seeing my potential and my value that woke me up to maybe I don't have to wait. You and I were talking before we started Mm -hmm. about how you can't wait until you feel 100% ready. Because if I waited until I felt 100% ready to write a book, I would not have written anything, any books, there would be nothing. And so it was, it, it did take someone outside of me saying, have you thought about this? That actually got my gears turning to say, maybe I can do this. And yeah, from there, it is is a very painstaking <laughs> process to write a book. It will bring up all of your insecurities, but it is the most gratifying thing I have ever done just because of the way it challenges you to be clear and digestible about your thinking but also the impact it makes. Again, you you and I were talking about how you stumbled across my book randomly in a Barnes and Noble and it spoke to you. And here we are chatting. That's just the most, you can't replace a, a feeling like that. And it really is the most meaningful thing to have the book out there, reaching people, making a difference for people and hearing those stories is, it just means the world. It's made a huge difference in my life. It's called Trust Yourself, Stop Overthinking and Channel Your Emotions for success and work. And I'm assuming that this book came out of your experiences in your workplace in the toxic environment that you mentioned. Yeah, it it definitely came out of my own personal experience growing up as someone who was always told, you're too sensitive. You should grow a thicker skin. Why do you take everything so personally? And also just observing that everything seemed to affect me so much more deeply and it affected other people around me, my friends, other other people in my family. And I thought I was broken or I was weird. I didn't even have words for it until I came across Dr. Elaine Aaron's book, who is the original researcher who wrote the book, The Highly Sensitive Person. Mm-hmm. And it was like the world opened up and suddenly, suddenly everything made sense. That being highly sensitive, this is not a character defect. This is not something I have to fix. It's something that just is. And when I was able to understand that, I could have so much more objectiveness about the way I approach situations, taking off that layer of shame, and also knew how to start to optimize my relationships and my work environment to work for me instead of against me, knowing that I'm someone who 
I don't like to be observed or feel like people are monitoring me. And so I once worked in this really small office in Manhattan, many offices are small in Manhattan because space is at a premium. But this was the type of office where everyone was sitting basically in a circle. You could see everybody's computers. If you backed up your chair, you hit other people. Mm. And I felt like I was in a fishbowl to the point I, I couldn't stand it. I quit a few months in because I just, I couldn't take it. And things like that suddenly made sense. But what I found in my own life and, and certainly my work with clients is that there was this other piece of achievement and drive of always wanting to do more, be better, take on bigger goals, constantly be pushing yourself, not necessarily to climb the ladder or get a certain title or promotion, but because we just have that innate mm -hmm. inner drive, the interest in personal development. And of course, all of these things can be tremendous advantages, but if we're not aware of them or don't know how to manage them in the right ways, it can hold us back. Yeah. And something that you mentioned in the first chapter, I believe you talk about a sensitive striver. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yes. So that is the term I've given to someone who is both highly sensitive, which very simply put means you have a more active nervous system. You have a more responsive nervous system to what's happening within and around you. So you are someone who is highly sensitive. You think and feel things more deeply but you are also a high achiever. You are driven. You put a lot of pressure on yourself to succeed. And that in a nutshell is what a sensitive striver is. So it's really this combination of the way you are wired with also the way you are conditioned and, and brought up. In the book, I talk about how there are six key qualities to being a sensitive striver. And each of these, when they are well-balanced, again, can be an attribute but if it is unbalanced, and so I can walk through this quickly because I think it can also help people zero in on what specifically is my struggle a bit more. So first is the S, which unsurprisingly is sensitivity. So that is, what is your physical responsiveness? Are you able to stay calm and composed under pressure? Or are you getting overwhelmed, overstimulated very easily? T is for thoughtfulness. Are you reaping the upsides of being reflective, intuitive, perceptive, or are you stuck in the downsides of gang self-consciousness indecision? Next, we have our responsibility. That is sensitive strivers. We are very loyal. We are very dedicated. We will go out of our way for people many times to our own detriment. So we can be really big people pleasers and, and over functioners. Then there is inner drive. So that's that desire to get all the A pluses and gold stars. Again, we can be very high achievers, but can become perfectionists and really start to set ourselves up for failure because our goals are too high. Then is vigilance, being aware of the subtleties, the nuances around you, great for being able to read the room, respond to the context that's happening around you. But you're always on high alert. You're always, you might be overly vigilant and preoccupied with that. And then last is emotionality. We tend to have big emotions, more intense emotions than most people. We get the upside of that, a lot of joy, pride, gratitude. But the downside, we may stay stuck in frustration, annoyance, anger than most people. When you first shared the term sensitive striver and started talking about this out in public, what was the kind of response you received? Yeah, I was surprised. I was very nervous to put it out there again, because sensitivity has such a stigma connected to it. But I was surprised how many people immediately said, oh my God, this is me. You are describing me to a T and I have never heard anyone describe my life. <laughs> and who I am in such a succinct way. And so a lot of people just immediately, I, I wouldn't even have to describe it many times, and they would say, yes, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for putting a label on what I've struggled with because I've never feel like I fit in anywhere. And what was also really surprising to me is before I started talking about sensitive strivers, 
I would say 90% of my audience was women, people who identified as female. And now it's about split evenly. Talking about sensitivity, the number of men and people who identify as male that it has brought into my world has been incredible because I think men are really starved for this conversation. They're fed messages about you have to be macho. Don't let anyone see you sweat. Boys don't cry, right? Yet there are sensitivity is a genetic trait. And that means it's pretty evenly split in the population. And so that has been really affirming to see that people feel it describes them. They feel included. They feel like they belong. And it just has removed so much shame for people about, I thought I was the only person that reacted this way or who, that felt this way. And even just knowing I am not alone allows me to move forward so much more easily because I don't have that layer of self-blame and recrimination over everything. I'm wondering if there's any research out there that shows the relationship between people who have a physical disability and sensitivity. Because I know for myself, having cerebral palsy and and trying to navigate the, I guess, struggles or adversity on a daily basis also makes me attuned to the world around me. Now, I don't know how much that sensitivity is influenced by my disability, but I would guess that it's more so like you're saying, it's it's in the, the DNA or is that what you said, a personality trait? Yeah. yeah. And so again, it's a bit nature and nurture. And I was thinking about this before we started recording. I was asking myself the same question because I don't know of any specific research that has looked at high sensitivity within people with disabilities, because of course that's a broad mm -hmm. category. But my nudge, my intuitive nudge is that makes sense. Again, you may have a certain amount of people that are already predisposed to being more sensitive. But then when you live with a disability, again, depending on what type it is, you do have to be more attuned to people's body language and emotions. You may have to communicate in different ways. You may have to be more in touch with what's happening in your own body. It may also affect your ability to process and manage your own thoughts and emotions. So there's a lot of intersectionality here. It's by no means very black and white. And sensitivity exists on a spectrum, right? So it's just like any other personality trait. You may be more sensitive or you may be towards the middle range. And so I think that's important just to realize that it, it's not black and white by any means. In your research and experience, why do you think it's so hard for people to trust themselves? Yeah, so many reasons. I think one of them we've already mentioned, which is if you are more sensitive, you've grown up with this message of you're not okay as you are. You can't trust yourself. And so I think many of us just that's sort of <laughs> embedded in our mm -hmm. psyche. And now just very practically speaking, there's so much information. There's so many people to compare yourself to. There's so many people out there, including me. I'm guilty of this. I'm in the personal and professional development space. But there's so many people saying, this is the right way to do something, or this is the way to succeed, that sometimes you don't know which way is up. And certainly in the workplace now, most of a lot of trust yourself is about your career and how this shows up in the workplace. There's so much ambiguity and uncertainty. Uh, the, the book came out during the pandemic. And I saw for so many people that shift to remote work introduced so much overthinking because now all of a sudden they're saying, my boss used a period instead of an exclamation point. Do they hate me? Am I getting fired? Because our brains will go wild trying to fill in those gaps. And so I think that has a lot to do with it. In the book, I talk about this concept of the honor roll hangover, which is that A plus gold star student mentality carrying over into our careers and the rest of our lives where we're trying to judge ourselves and live up to a certain standard that in reality doesn't even exist. Yeah, I think there's just 
there's so many reasons why it is difficult mm-hmm. to trust yourself now. You also mentioned in the book, you say, fake it till you make it doesn't work. Why do you say that? Or why do you think that? Yeah, I, because I think if you are faking it, you are trying to be someone you're not, right? And that can do more harm than good because you feel like you're putting on a performance. You feel like there is a, what I see with a lot of sensitive strivers is the perfectionistic thought that there is one right way to do something. And a lot of times this comes up with career decisions or even things like people will always ask me about executive presence, this elusive executive presence. And they think there's one way. And if they just do certain mannerisms or carry their body in a certain way, they will have executive presence. And again, it's not that binary. And fake it till you make it has that idea embedded in it that if I just act a certain way, then I will automatically feel confident, but it won't feel authentic and true to you. And it will be hard to keep up And so that's why it can backfire because it can almost make you feel further from yourself and more like an imposter than it helps. I also think that term isn't always applicable to everybody. Now, going back to somebody with a disability, that's a little bit more complicated because then you're adding another layer. So in terms of the um, perception of how other people view people with disabilities, if someone with a disability, and I'm not sure You may be aware, but the unemployment rate for people with disabilities is twice the amount for people that don't have a disability. So there's a lot that, a lot of roadblocks that can prevent someone with a disability from getting a job. Mm -hmm. And I think one of those is some prejudice that somebody might have, or their perception that somebody can't do the job, or if they need accommodations, then maybe we don't want to invest that money or so many different things that maybe is out of that person's control with the disability. And so faking it till you make it's really not going to make a difference because you're going to still be the same person with the disability and you can't change other people's opinions about yourself. So like, I don't know how that fake it till you make it could be applicable to somebody with a disability. Yeah. And it's also, I see this in multiple ways and I would assume it's, you you can tell me if it's true Mm -hmm. for the folks you have spoken with, but those perceptions or attitudes other people have can then become a self-fulfilling prophecy for you, right? Because you think they didn't want me. They don't think I'm good enough. I might as well stop applying for jobs. Nobody's going to want me, right? And then you take yourself out of the running altogether rather than realizing that is, unfortunately, it is far too many people's opinions, but it is one person's opinion. Yet this is the importance of trusting yourself. If you let that define you, you're not going to be able to move forward and be successful and do what you're meant to do. And it's hard to go against that, but a lot of it is, and what I hope to do in the book is give people skills for coaching themselves out of some of those unhelpful thinking patterns. They can reach their goals. Is there a favorite chapter that you enjoyed writing? I I was actually talking about this earlier today. My, My favorite chapter is the one on assertive communication. And I think it's called, I think it's about speaking up. I've Honestly, I forget what the exact title is, but it's the chapter on assertive communication because I really feel we teach people how to treat us. And what I see so many sensitive strivers fall into is that they are far too passive in interactions or they, through their own actions, inadvertently teach other people to treat them like garbage. So a very common example that we'll see in the workplace is, and I certainly fell fell into this, that you are responding to messages at all hours. You respond two seconds after you get something. And guess what? That can create this perception or make other people dependent that you will always be responsive. You will always be the one to volunteer everything to the point that when you don't do those things, people get angry or they get upset 
because they had come to expect that of you. And so teaching people how to treat you is really how do you carry yourself with greater assertiveness, not being a jerk, but with greater self-respect and confidence in your preferences, your boundaries, your thoughts, your requests, so that other people respond to that confidence differently. So I love that chapter because it was a lot of fun to write different scripts and things like that. And I really love that sort of crunchy brass tacks sort of stuff. And you are also a speaker. You've given a TEDx talk about dealing with self-doubt. And one thing in particular that stood out to me was when you said naming it and reframing it. Can you give an example about what this is? Yes. So name it and reframe it, clever way to be able to identify overthinking or self-doubt in its tracks and really try to change the narrative around it. So I find so many of us, we just go through our day with negative, unhelpful thinking, just being our default, right? That I'm so terrible at everything. No one likes me. I'm never going to be successful. Why should I even try at X, Y, Z? And again, that becomes a self-fulfilling process, but it's so automatic that we don't even recognize it. And I think it's the stat is something like you think tens of thousands of thoughts a day, more than 80% are negative. The human brain is wired for that because it wants to keep us safe. Mm. And so naming it is catching that, is catching, you can either name your inner critic, you can give it a name that is separate from you, or you could name that sort of soundtrack in your head. This is the I'm not good enough story again. There it is. There it goes again. And reframe it. What's a more helpful, encouraging, empathetic, even just realistic way to view this situation? Or what's another possibility that could be true here? So for example, someone not responding to your email doesn't mean that you've lost out on an opportunity. It could mean they're busy, the person had a medical emergency, who knows? And that can be the difference between taking action to follow up or just not and letting something pass you by. Now, is that also another form of overthinking? I would say so. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And I think that overthinking, at least for me, really short circuits my brain because then I fall into this place where I've lost motivation to do X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you see with other clients who are overthinking as well? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like to say that overthinking, we usually think about it as thinking too much. And I want to encourage people to think about it more as the quality of your thinking. Mm-hmm. Is it moving you ahead? Is it getting you the results that you want? Because you can deliberate deeply about something for a long time. But in doing so, you're gradually making more decisions. It feels like you're making progress. It feels satisfying. Whereas with overthinking, it feels demoralizing, draining. It tends to be circular and more negative. And so it's not necessarily how long you're thinking. It's the quality. Mm. That's good for my listeners to know because I think we all deal with, in one way or another, at maybe one time or another, dealing with overthinking or letting the quality of our thoughts, or maybe not having very good quality of thoughts, and that's what is making making us stuck in not taking action. So, finally, what is next for you? I know that I see you post a lot on LinkedIn and Instagram, but Do you have any other projects coming up? And outside from your coaching and counseling practice, what other things do you currently do? Yeah, yeah, it's an exciting time. In the near future, I'll have two more LinkedIn learning courses coming out. So I already have seven. I'll be up to nine. One is about power dynamics in the workplace. And another is about having an ownership mindset. So look out for those. My second book comes out next year, and that will be all about managing up and how do you manage up specifically to teach people how to treat you, to reclaim your sense of freedom and agency at work. And then beyond that, yes, I run a group program called Resilience. At the time we're talking, it's actually open for enrollment again. I run a 
program for graduates of that. And I take a small amount of one-on-one clients every year. But yes, also do speaking and trainings for companies. So I like to keep my hands in different things to keep it keep it interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much, Melody, for coming on my podcast and sharing about your experience with how to silence your inner critic, trusting ourselves, and just become better versions of ourselves. Thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for tuning in to today's show. Follow me on social media at Off The Crutch or email me at offthecrutch at gmail.com. I would love to hear your comments, questions, or if you want to be on my podcast. Until next time, everybody, take care.